thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Stephen, and thanks so much uh, for inviting me to, to speak uh, here uh, today. I mean, it is a real uh, pleasure and a, and a privilege to, uh, be, to address uh, an audience like this with so much uh, expertise from across academia, academia business, uh, and the public sector. Uh, you, you may find this hard to believe, but uh, not everybody in Parliament always knows what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it is precisely uh, your, your talent, uh, your experiences, and which is uh, really uh, important, your capacity for innovation that has made the White City Innovation District the success that it is. And uh, we, which I mean Labour, but I think I also mean the country, uh, want to see that success uh, replicated across the whole country. Um, and as Stephen said, I am an Imperial uh, graduate. It's a, it's a long, long time ago, uh, but it's still the true that whenever I find myself in an Imperial uh, lecture theatre, I can't help wondering if I've done my homework. <laughs> of course, um, it was, um, I, 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 was, uh, I was at the, the, other, uh, ca the other campus, uh, um, some miles from here, but um, it, well, I, the last time I was here um, in, in, at this campus was in 2018, uh, when I was really impressed that by the innovation of the startups that I, that I met then. But also, and I think Stephen sort of reflected this, and something that's really important as we do, for the policies that we're developing, I was really impressed by the level of community engagement. Um, and it has clearly gone from strength to strength. And now, um, um, Stephen talked about um, Hammersmith and Fulham's industrial strategy, which um, I want to pay tribute to. Uh, Labour's sort of overall industrial strategy we announced in uh, 2022. And uh, it was clear in our ambition, and we said that we'd be looking to, at ways to improve collaboration between universities, businesses, and local institutions to, to develop clusters of regional capabilities. And Hammersmith and Fulham's industrial strategy, which was launched in, in 2017, is an excellent case study for the power of industrial strategy. And you know, let's not forget it is, well, I'm, I'm not going to talk very much about the, the, the Conservatives at the moment because, you know, that's not your, your special interest. But I think it's important to recognise that industrial strategy, we've gone through, we've gone through cycles of uh, appreciation or contempt for industrial strategy with successive Conservative governments. We are very clear about the power of industrial strategy and learning the lessons from Hammersmith and Fulham and the industrial strategy here will help us to turn our ambition of the, for the whole country um, into achievement that we can all be proud of. Because as uh, Stephen said, the record speaks for itself. £6 billion invested into local businesses since the Hammersmith and Fulham industrial strategy was launched. That's a really eye-catching achievement, particularly with 85% of that concentrated in STEM sectors around the White City Innovation District, including £1.6 billion for the life sciences. And this um, investment makes a real difference to people's lives. It's delivered over 8,100 jobs in highly skilled sectors, over 2,700 in the life sciences alone. And that message is something that I really want to get across on the doorsteps of Hammersmith and Fulham and also on the doorsteps of Newcastle and Bradford and Bristol. The, the realisation, the fact that we do not have to accept a low-wage, low-skill, zero-hour contract economic and economic conditions, that we can deliver well-paid, highly skilled jobs for people across the country. And that's what we can see here in West London. And so the, the, the fact that the, the council, Imperial College, charities, business, and the NHS, such a key institution, particularly for life sciences, have all come together to collaborate is a model that we are looking at very, very closely. And that purposeful building of connections has produced results that should raise the aspirations of politicians in both local and national government 
across the country. So great credit to uh, Councillor Stephen Cohen and the rest of the council for setting out that leadership. Um, because it's not only about the direct investment in, in, and people directly employed in the sciences, it's about the uplift to the local economy. It's about the pride that people can have in hosting cutting edge science and research, and it's about inspiring the next generation. And I think it's really interesting, the uh, case, the Campaign for Science and Education, we pushed a report a few months ago, which was uh, into looking at attitudes to science. A lot of interesting things to take away, particularly about the difference in attitudes to science between different demographics. But, almost, but what was clear was that all communities wanted to have a science asset, a lab or something, in their community. That was something that was, that was something that people felt they would be proud of, and uh, and uh, it was really uh, touched a chord with me uh, because um, you know I was one of those irritating well in some ways irritating young uh, girls who knew exactly what they wanted to be. I knew that I wanted to be an engineer uh, from a very young age, from about the age of nine, you know, but I wasn't aware of any any female engineers. And that made it quite hard to argue with those uh, in the playground, but also older, <laughs> older people, uh, who said that girls could not do engineering. Uh, I suffered from what I now call Marie Curie syndrome, which is the inability to name more than one female scientist or engineer. <laughs> now, I went on to study engineering at Imperial, and it was, just to be clear, it was the basis for an absolutely fantastic career in professional engineering, which took me all over the world. Um, I almost always say that uh, being the Member of Parliament for Newcastle, Pontine Central, is the best job in the world, and the second best job is being an engineer. Uh, but the progress in increasing the diversity of STEM has been far too slow. Uh, I was first elected to Parliament in 2010, when women made up 10.5% of all engineers. Um, actually, coincidentally or not, that was about the proportion on my engineering, electrical engineering course at Imperial back in the 80s. Um, by 2022, that has risen to 16.5%. That's progress, but it's not good enough. Uh, Labour is looking at ways in which we can encourage young people to pursue careers in STEM, specifically to support early career researchers, I don't feel they'll have enough support now, to progress and remain in the workforce and to tackle the specific barriers faced by people from diverse backgrounds in their careers. And outreach, not a term I'm particularly enamoured of, but I can't think of a better one, but outreach by Imperial around White City as part of their ambition for an inclusive innovation district is an inspiring model for the country. Whether it's the Agents of Change initiative supporting local women or the What the Tech programme combating digital isolation in old people or Imperial STEM uh, activities for over 3,000 children a year, it's great to see innovation and inclusion working in tandem here. So I hope that the, that the nine-year-olds around this campus, they know and can name great engineers of all different backgrounds. Now, of course, the success of the life sciences here ha has positive wide-reaching benefits across the country, whether economically or in health. And we all saw that firsthand during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also show, saw that targeted long-term investment in life sciences by successive governments, as it, was, it did not happen, whilst the COVID uh, vaccine might have happened almost overnight, that base on which this discovery was built took many years to build. And it was a, was a crucial building block of this UK strength and expertise in the life sciences. And beginning with the establishment, or beginning decades and gen, uh, generations ago, but the establishment of the Biosciences Innovation and Growth Team by the then Labour government in 2022. So when the pandemic began, the convening power of the state was instrumental in leveraging the expertise, um, that expertise bringing various actors together and ultimately producing a new vaccine which helped make the world safer. 
And that was the latest chapter, if you like, in the proud history of life sciences in the UK. And it's that heritage that Labour would hope to add to in government through our plan for life sciences, which we launched last week and which obviously I highly recommend to you all, which it's, it's called a prescription for growth. Um, it, it, and it emphasises how life sciences are key to our economy, key to our growth and key to improving people's quality of life. And I would, we hope that everybody in this room could agree on that. And we know that to achieve our first mission in government, should we have the privilege of serving, we will have a mission-led government. And the very first mission that Keir Starmer has set out, one which is so critical to all my constituents' well-being, is just to secure the highest sustained growth in the G7. That's a huge ambition, given the levels of growth we've seen over the last 14 years. And to do that, we need to build on the life sciences vision and unleash the full potential of the sector. So if, you know, if um, labor, we, you know, we need to return the, the sector to the high growth rates of the past. And if Labour restored UK life sciences research and development share to its 2012 level, level by 2028, this could mean an extra £10 billion R&D investment in the UK. That's a private sector uh, 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 investment. So you know, I won't, I'm not going to go through the whole plan with you yet because I don't have a whole <laughs> hour. But um, I do want to emphasize some of the highlights and by do so encourage you to get in touch if there's anything you'd like to raise with me based on your experiences in research and development here or, or your careers more widely. So one of the most important things to get right is the business environment and in life sciences and across my brief, British innovators are developing world leading products but they can often face significant barriers just to get started in a number of areas, but particularly in regulation. So, for example, you can require you know, a startup with some new and innovative product, where in life sciences or also in clean technology, it can. I've talked to businesses where they are facing regulation from up to 11 different regulators. That's a huge minefield to try and cross. So, Labour would establish a regulatory innovation office to help um, address end regulatory backlogs, to hold regulators to account, uh, to provide strategic steers from the industrial strategy, and to bring new innovations to market sooner. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'd be really keen to hear what particular, any particular regulatory barriers that the startups and spin-outs in this room are facing. But I also want to recognize that um, regulation you know, can be a barrier to innovation, but the right regulation can also be a driver for innovation by supporting competition, standardization, and integration. And I'm also very keen to hear examples where you see that can happen. Uh, now, we've also announced our intentions to provide stability and certainty for innovation by taking a long-term approach to public research and development funding. So, so we've announced that we will keep uh, the current R&D tax credit structure over the next parliament whilst we will be evaluating sector by sector the, um, the, the impact of R&D tax credits, uh, starting with the life sciences sector. And we've also announced that we would have 10-year R&D budgets for key research institutions. And that's a, sort of, that's a key uh, commitment to long-termism in research and development funding. And it will create a more certain environment, a more certain funding environment more streamlined uh, funding processes to end uh, the current uh, government uh, short-termism and attract long-term investment. And it will also enable long-term partnerships between business and universities. And very, very important, and also, you know, I talk, talked about early career researchers and the short-term the the short contracts that so many early career researchers face which have a number of disadvantages. It also it, it, it makes it harder for those uh, with caring commitments. It reduces the, the diversity of the sector. So long-term uh, R&D budget should help support greater job security, 
within the sector, within the early career sector as well. Um, and it should also, um, it's, a, you know, it's part of a wider agenda of reform that will address some of the issues with the current public sec public funding environment um, by introducing a system of earned trust in place of retrospective and repetitive reporting and an audit by government departments and UKRI. And so to take advantage of that attractive, stable environment for investment, we want to ensure that we can develop many more clusters for life science capabilities like the White City Innovation District. We want them across the UK. And that also requires planning reform in which to make it easier to build the labs, the housing and the facilities uh, that we need. And we will be looking, we will be addressing, we will be, you know, Get built Britain building again is about getting Britain building labs as well as houses. And the final area I want to talk to you about is our is probably you know, one of the most relevant to people here, our ambitions for startups and spin outs. So we had the Labour Review led by Lord Jim O'Neill um, of, well, of, of Gritstone fame and others. Um, and as outlined in our life sciences strategy, there are more spin-outs in life sciences than in any other sector, uh, with the founding of 309 pharmaceutical spin-outs between 2011 and 2023. And I, you know, I know that many such businesses are here today. 57% of startups and spin-outs companies co-located on the Imperial uh, campus work in the life sciences. And uh, that includes pioneering startups like um, Medisiv, Azo Labs, uh, DNA, uh, or Pair Bio. And we have many fantastic bio startups across the country which are driving growth, improving health outcomes, and changing lives. And just to mention another of our, we have five key missions, and one is getting, uh, well, getting the NHS uh, back on its feet again, and delivering an NHS fit for the future, and obviously the biosciences are a critical part of that. So we've said that we will increase the number of spin-outs coming out of universities and structure the innovation funding system to ensure that more of them successfully scale up. We have, well, we have more than one, if you like, valley of death, but we have, we have certainly issues with, with access to capital for spin-outs and also particularly for scale-ups. Uh, particularly for deep tech. And this will include working with universities to encourage them to offer spin-outs a founder track option, one where the university takes a share of equity at or below 10%. Uh, and our plans for financial services, so last week we also uh, launched our, uh, our plans for financial services called Financial Growth, again I recommend it, um, and that was launched by Rachel Reeves and Tulip Siddiq. And that will help to unlock much more capital to help to fuel the startup spin-outs and scale-ups uh, that we want to see. We will reinvigorate our capital markets uh, by reviewing the pensions and retirement saving landscapes. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the if you like the ironies that we have a uh, a lack of investment capital right next to one of the great if not the great uh, capital markets of the world. And so we'll, and we'll also be empowering the British Business Bank to invest more in growth capital and establishing a British TB scheme. And those of you who know what that is will, will know what it is, as it were. Um, to, and that's to increase institutional investment in venture capital. So it's quite, a, I mean, I've gone through you know, a number of policies there. We have, life sciences has been, you know, it, it's been a key to our approach to science, but also more widely to, to growth. Um, it's something that Rachel Reeves talks about a lot, as does Keir Starmer, um, as does uh, West, West Streeting, our, our Shadow Secretary of State for, for Health. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a critical part of our agenda. That's why I was so pleased to come here today and to see the success of the White City Innovation District, and that's something that we really wish to emulate across the, the, the country, because this it represents so many of the things that we are believing, a successful and, and, and established and consistent industrial strategy, collaboration between actors, you know, with the convening power of, of local or national government, 
Access to capital, capital has driven increased pro prosperity and opportunity, which can actually be felt by constituents. I mean, one of the things that's really important that we recognize as people in the, the science world is that it's the, the public understanding of science and the benefits that science brings, and that includes specifically jobs and income, is absolutely critical to creating a country where science is valued and where innovation thrives and drives our economic and cultural well-being. And it's that kind of leadership that I want to see emulated across the country. And it's that kind of success which I hope, uh, I, if, should, should we, should we uh, be elected to serve, it's that kind of success which a Labour government would, like, would, would seek to drive across our entire country. Thank you very much. <laughs>